take a look at this image here. I promise you there's an image there. It was taken at F2, one second shutter speed, and ISO 800. And look what happens when I do plus four exposure value in Lightroom. Boom, we now have a stunning picture of the Aurora Borealis above the Norwegian fjords. And despite boosting the exposure of a massively underexposed image, it's pretty clean. There's not much noise there. So why is this? It's all thanks to something known as ISO invariance. So in today's video, I'm going to explain to you guys what ISO invariance is, how we can test our cameras to see whether they are ISO invariant or ISO variant. And then from that, we can find out what the best ISO to use for your camera is in low light conditions. Then I'm going to explain some use cases where ISO invariance is really useful. But what I'm not going to do is explain the technicalities of the camera electronic circuitry that enables this behavior, because I don't think many of you would be interested in that. But if it does interest you, I'll put a link to another video in the description down below, which I think is one of the best explanations on YouTube that's also quite easy to digest and understand. But before we get into the nitty gritty of today's video, a quick message from the sponsors, NordVPN. And if you didn't know what a VPN is, it basically encrypts the connection between your computer and the internet, which protects your data from hackers, from snooping governments, and those pesky websites that log your searches and target you with specific ads. Now, I personally will never use a public Wi-Fi without using a VPN server because you never know how secure that public Wi-Fi is or whether there's hackers just waiting for people to log in so they can steal their data and steal their information. So I will always use a VPN service when I'm using public Wi-Fi. Another good use for VPN servers is that you can pretend that you're in a different country and unlock content that is geographically specific. So for example, I'm currently in Turkey and until recently, Wikipedia was blocked by the government. So I had to access Wikipedia through a VPN server. You can also use it for streaming services like Netflix, so you can pretend you're in the USA, for example, and unlock content that is only available for those in the USA. Now, there are plenty of free VPN services out there, but I choose to pay for NordVPN, firstly because it's really affordable, but also because it's fast. A lot of the free VPN services really slow down your internet, but with NordVPN, the server's really fast and your internet flows just as normal. Another good thing is that they have apps for Windows PCs, Apple computers, iPhones, and Android phones. So you can use NordVPN on pretty much all of your devices. To celebrate their ninth birthday, NordVPN are giving away one free month with every two year subscription, plus a surprise gift, because who doesn't love surprises? I mean, I could tell you what the gifts are, but then it wouldn't be a surprise. So follow the link in the video description down below. Use my special code to get your free month, your special gift, and make sure your connection to the internet is secured with NordVPN. So what is ISO invariance? Let's pretend we have a perfectly ISO invariant camera and we take two images at f2.8, 15 seconds, but with different ISOs, so ISO 100, and ISO 3200. If we take the ISO 100 image in post-production and boost the exposure by five EV or five stops, the two images will look pretty much identical. They'll have the same amount of noise and it'll be impossible to tell which one was taken at ISO 3200 and which one was taken at ISO 100. So ISO 3200 is five stops brighter than ISO 100. A stop is basically when you halve or double the amount of light in an image or the exposure of an image. And for ISO 100, you double it to get 200, double again to get 400, 800, 1600, 3200. So ISO 3200 is five stops brighter than ISO 100. So because there's the same amount of noise in the 100 image and the 3200 image, we can say that the amount of noise in the image is invariant of the ISO setting that you used. So boosting or dropping the exposure in post-production is exactly the same as changing the ISO in camera in the field. So sometimes these cameras are known as ISO-less cameras. Now let's do the same with an ISO variant camera. So two images, f2.8, 15 seconds, 
ISO 100 and another image at ISO 3200. But this time, when we boost the exposure of the ISO 100 image by five stops, we get an image with much more noise, a lot more grain and degradation of the image quality. So with ISO variant cameras, we can say that the amount of noise in the image varies depending on the ISO setting that you use. So with ISO variant cameras, you have to be careful what ISO setting you use in the field because you don't have that freedom to boost or drop the exposure in post-production like you do with ISO invariant cameras. I hope I haven't lost you yet. Now, I'm not sure who was the first to do this kind of sensor technology, but I think Sony can be credited at least for bringing it into the mainstream because all of the cameras on the market that exhibit ISO invariant behavior are either Sony cameras, like the Sony Alpha cameras, or cameras from other manufacturers that have Sony sensors in them, like the Nikon D750 and the Fujifilm X-T1, both very ISO invariant cameras, both have Sony sensors in them. But I'm not sure exactly who was the first to do this kind of technology, but a lot of the signs point to Sony. Canon DSLRs, I want to say all of them, but I'm not 100% sure, so I'll say most of them, most Canon DSLRs are ISO variant. You really have to use the right ISO in camera. But it's not as straightforward as a camera being ISO variant or ISO invariant. There's a few different behaviors. So we have ISO invariant cameras, which are quite rare. The Fujifilm X-T1 is a really good example. Like all of the ISO settings are ISO invariant. The Nikon D750 is very close but ISO 100 is very noisy. From 200 onwards, it's ISO invariant. We also have dual gain ISO invariant cameras. So you have two levels of ISO invariance. And you may have heard me talk about this with my Sony a7 III in my past videos. So from ISO 100 to 500, it's ISO invariant. All the images look pretty much the same as long as all the other settings are kept the same. But then from ISO 640 upwards, there's another level of ISO invariance where all of the images from 640 upwards will pretty much look the same as long as all the other settings are kept the same. So there's two levels of ISO invariance. These are known as dual gain ISO cameras. And usually the higher ISOs, so from 640 and upwards, those ISOs are better suited to low light conditions. They'll have less noise than the lower ISO images. Then of course we have ISO variant cameras where the noise varies as you change the ISO. But at some point, most ISO variant cameras begin to show ISO invariant behavior, which all might sound a little bit confusing right now, but let's find out whether your camera is ISO variant or ISO invariant. To do this, Take your camera into a low light scene, whether that's a dimly lit room or a nighttime scene with not much light pollution. Make sure your camera is in manual mode. Make sure you turn off long exposure noise reduction. Make sure you turn off high exposure noise reduction. And then you wanna keep your aperture and shutter speed the same for all the shots. So for me, at a nighttime scene with not much light pollution, I'd probably do f2.8 and 15 seconds and then take different exposures at different ISOs. And rather than doing every ISO setting on your camera, just stick to the full stop. So 100, 200, 400, 800, 600, 3200, and so on. Once you've done that, take your images into Lightroom or whichever raw editing software you use. And the idea now is to match the total exposure values of the images. So to match the exposures in Lightroom, we're gonna use the exposure slider. And because the exposure slider only goes to plus five and minus five, we're gonna start with the ISO 100 image and do plus five exposure. On the ISO 200 image, we're gonna do plus four. On the ISO 400 image, we're gonna do plus three and so on and so on until you get to ISO 3200 where you can just leave it set to zero and then the ISO 6400 is minus one exposure, ISO 12800 is minus two exposure, but there's a quick and easy way to do this in Lightroom. So make sure you've got the images in the same folder and then what you want to do is select the ISO 3200 image, press D to go into develop mode, 
Press Ctrl and A to select all of the images in the folder, or Command and A on a Mac. And then you can come up to Settings, Match Total Exposures, or you can see there's a keyboard shortcut, Control, Alt, Shift, and M, or Command, Alt, Shift, and M on a Mac. So pressing that, Lightroom is automatically going to match the exposure value of all of these images. So as you can see, all of the images are now the same brightness. If you wanted to make any adjustments, so for example, the exposure overall is a bit dark. So if I was to lift the shadows and lift the blacks to see what's going on a little bit better, I can now sync the settings with all of these images. But I'm going to check none and just tick shadows and blacks. And now all of the images will have the shadows and the blacks adjusted, but the exposures are going to be left so that they're all the same exposure value. Now we can assess the images and find out whether your camera is ISO variant or ISO invariant. And I'm going to show you three different examples. So let's start with the Canon 6D, which is an ISO variant camera. So with the Canon 6D, I took this shot at 50mm, f2.8, 8 seconds. These are the settings for all of the images, but I just changed the ISO. So this is ISO 100, and you can see that it's awful. It's full of noise and color degradation. But then when we get to ISO 200, the noise improves a little bit better. So does the color degradation. At ISO 400, the noise continues to improve. Again, at 800, the noise continues to improve. The color degradation also continues to improve. 1600, again, we see a slight improvement in noise performance. 3200, hard to tell, but I think just a slight improvement in noise performance. And then 6400, pretty much the same as the 3200 image. 12800, again, pretty much the same. And then 25600, again, pretty much the same. So the Canon 60 is ISO variant up until about 3200 and then starts to show ISO invariant behavior. And I'm sure a lot of you are quite surprised that as I increased the ISO, the noise performance improved, which goes against the misconception in digital photography that increasing the ISO increases the amount of noise in your image. It's simply not true. So if that's new to you and you've learned something in this video already, do consider hitting that subscribe button if you haven't already and hit the bell notification as well so you don't miss out on these free useful videos. But let's take a look at another couple of examples. So my camera of choice, the Sony a7 III. So starting at ISO 100, we can see it's quite noisy. It's nowhere near as noisy as ISO 100 on the Canon 6D, but it's still pretty noisy and there's a heavy magenta cast on the image. I saw 200 and we see that magenta cast disappear and a bit of an improvement in noise performance. At ISO 400, the image looks pretty much identical to the ISO 200 image, but then when we jump to ISO 800, there's a slight improvement in noise performance, which might be difficult to see on YouTube because YouTube compresses videos and you lose quality in the video. So you're just gonna have to take my word for it. And I've obviously tried all of the ISOs on my Sony a7 III camera and I know that uh, between 200 and 500, it's ISO invariant. And then from 640 upwards, it's ISO invariant. So there's two layers of ISO invariant. It's a dual gain ISO invariant camera. So if we continue upwards from 800 to 1600, apart from that red light that appeared, the image is pretty much exactly the same. The noise is the same. 3200, again, the noise is exactly the same. 6400, no changes to the noise performance. 12800, for some reason slightly darker, but still no real change in the noise performance. And then 25600, again, no real change in the noise performance. It looks pretty much the same as all of the images that we just looked at from ISO 800. So that is a dual gain ISO camera. Now let's have a look at the Nikon D750. So again, starting at ISO 100, the image is pretty noisy, similar to the A7 III maybe, uh, and a lot better than the Canon 60. 
But as we jump to 200, there's a slight improvement in noise performance and the colors are a little bit better. But then ISO 400, I messed up the shot. Um, but it's pretty much the same as the ISO 200 image. And again, ISO 800, still pretty much the same noise performance. 1600, same noise performance. 3200, same noise performance. And this continues all the way up until 25,600. So apart from ISO 100, which is slightly worse than the rest of them, the Nikon D750 is pretty much ISO invariant. The amount of noise in the images don't change when you change the ISO. So that's a pretty good ISO invariant camera. Now, 100% ISO invariant cameras are pretty hard to come by. The only one I really know of is the Fujifilm X-T1, but I'm sure there's more out there. I just haven't researched all of the cameras out there. So how can we use these test results to decide what the best ISO is for your camera in low light scenes? To assess that, we need to know a couple of things. The first thing is that as you increase ISO, your camera captures less dynamic range. So as you increase the ISO, you'll capture less dynamic range. And the dynamic range is the difference between the darkest areas of the scene and the lightest areas of the scene. So as you increase the ISO, the dynamic range decreases. The second thing you need to know, which is pretty much a consequence of the first thing, is that as you increase the ISO, you increase the risk of blowing out the highlights in your shot which means you lose detail and you lose color in the brighter regions of your shot. They become white and there's no way to recover that detail because they are fully blown out. So in that sense, we want to keep the ISO as low as possible so that we can capture the highest dynamic range and so that we can protect the highlights in the scene. But as you can see from the noise tests, we want to use a high enough ISO to get good noise performance. So the best ISO for your camera will be the lowest ISO that gives you the best noise performance. In the case of the Canon 60, it was ISO 3200, because after ISO 3200, there was no improvements in the noise performance. And if you go any higher than 3200, you're going to capture less dynamic range, and you're going to increase the risk of blowing up the highlights in your image. For me, with my Sony a7 III, the best ISO would be ISO 640, because after that, there's no improvements in noise performance. And again, we don't want to go higher because we captured less dynamic range. We increase the risk of blowing out the highlights. However, ISO 640 is very impractical in the field because your images will pretty much be black for the most part. So I still find myself shooting at ISO 3200, an ISO 6400 so that I can see what I'm doing. I can see the photographs that I'm taking in the field. But if there's a situation where I need to protect the highlights, if the moon is in the frame or the Aurora Borealis or a street light, I can take a shot at 3200 so I can compose my shot and then I'll bring the ISO down to 640, which is technically the best ISO for my camera in low light situations, which will protect the highlights and capture the highest dynamic range. With the Nikon D750, the best ISO would be 200 because 100 was slightly worse than all of the other ISOs. But ISO 200 offers you the best noise performance. You know, if you go any higher, you don't get any improvements in noise performance. But if you do go higher, you decrease the dynamic range that you capture and you increase the chance of blowing up the highlights in your image. I sound like a broken record, I'm sorry, but I hope you understand. But again, with the Nikon D750, ISO 200 is just not practical in the field. So you'd still want to use 3200, 6400, but if you need to protect the highlights, you can lower the ISO if need be. So this is the general idea of ISO invariance. If your camera is ISO invariant, you can lower your ISO to protect the highlights <laughs> and capture a higher dynamic range single exposure. So when is this useful? Well, I've just talked about a few example cases. If the moon is in your frame, the aurora borealis, or a street light, and you want to protect the detail in those highlights, you can use a lower ISO, and then you can bring out detail in the darker regions of the image, 
in post-production. And it's especially useful for time lapses of a moonrise or a moonset or the aurora borealis. You can use the lower limit of your ISO invariance and protect the highlights. So this is especially useful with the aurora because sometimes the aurora can just unexpectedly brighten significantly and suddenly. And if you're using that lower limit of your ISO invariance, you're going to protect the highlights from blowing out. If you were shooting at 3200 or 6400 because you were exposing for a dark scene, and then all of a sudden the aurora just ignites, your highlights are going to blow out and the aurora is going to be white and you're going to lose all the detail and color. And that happened to me in Norway, in Senja. So I'll just show you this example time lapse now. The aurora started off really dim and then all of a sudden it just, whoosh, just illuminated the entire landscape. But because I was using ISO invariance, the low ISO, my highlights were protected and I didn't lose any detail or color. If the aurora didn't ignite, I can boost the exposure value of the images in post-production and make them bright enough and decent enough to see the detail of the image. Now, an example where you can take advantage of the higher dynamic range you can capture with a lower ISO would be in deep space astrophotography. So a target like the Orion Nebula, as you saw in my recent vlog where I captured the Orion Nebula using my Sony a7 III, I shot at ISO 640 because that allowed me to protect the detail in the bright core of the nebula and then I can brighten the darker regions of the nebula and bring out those dust lanes in post-production without worrying about unveiling extra noise from boosting an underexposed image because the image is ISO invariant and you can just boost that brightness in the dark region. So this is a really good example of taking advantage of the higher dynamic range that you get at lower ISO values. Lastly, another good example is when you're doing a really wide panorama and somewhere in the panorama is a bright town or city and light pollution or even the moon perhaps. And you know, you, if you have an ISO variant camera, you might struggle to decide whether you want to expose for the darker area of the images and get a good Milky Way or a good aurora in the sky. But then when you get to the town or the city, your highlights are going to blow out. Or do you expose for the town and the city, protect the highlights, but then the rest of the image will be dark. With an ISO invariant camera, you don't need to worry about this. You can just shoot at the lower limit of ISO invariance, protect the highlights, capture images with a high dynamic range, and brighten the darker regions in post-production. Whew! I hope that makes sense. If you have any questions, please get in the comments down below, but I hope that makes sense. The general idea of ISO invariance is that it allows you to protect the highlights and capture images with a higher dynamic range. I think I've said that enough times now already. <laughs> so if you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button. And if you're going out to enjoy the night sky anytime soon, I wish you good luck in clear skies.